Okay, hello. For anybody that doesn't know me, my name is Michelle, and I have been playing Dota 2 for about 10 years. I started playing first in 2012, first match, 8-24-2012. And I wanted to create a guide on the hero, Oracle, because he is my absolute favorite hero, and I just enjoy playing him so much, and I've been asked um, some tips on how to play him, so... I wanted to go through and try to create something as detailed as possible with anything that I could come up with. Um, my win rate on the hero is 66%. It used to be, I think, just above 70% about three years ago. But um, yeah, let's get into it. So first off, I want to talk about just introducing his spells in general. And I also wanted to state that throughout this video, after I discuss what each spell does, I'm going to start calling them just by their keybind names because they're pretty long names. I don't want to be this saying the names throughout the well. entire video, so I'm going to be saying Q-W-E-R after we talk about what each spell does. So first, his Q is called Fortune's End, and instead of reading the entire tooltip, I'm also going to give a gist for what you should know about it. So this is basically a route that you channel. And as you can see, max channel time is 2.5 seconds. The longer you channel for, the longer they get rooted. And um, it also dispels any buffs that the target has on them. So what I love about Oracle is that all of the spells outside of his ultimate can be cast on both allied and enemy units. So if you channel somebody else, they get rooted, can't move around. Next up, we have Fate's Edict. So this spell disarms the person and grants them 100% magic resistance. Can be cast on allies and enemies. So disarm, or I give myself magic resistance. Yeah, so let's pick CM. And let's have her channel her ultimate. Okay. So I can sit in this and take absolutely no magic damage. Next up, don't kill me. All right. <laughs> Holy crap, the channel on that's really long. So next up, we have Purifying Flames. So this spell is basically a high magic damage nuke. And then afterwards, they get a heal per second. So nuke. Here, let me level this up a bit more. Nuke. And then healing up every second and then lastly we have his ultimate false promise this basically delays any healing or damage taken until the buff is over and it doubles the healing received it also strong dispels on application which means that if somebody is stunned say by like tidehunter ultimate or something it will dispel it off so let me show that real quick Okay, <laughs> I managed to get it. So you saw how this Tide Hunter, here, let me move him out a little bit more just so you can see because he was a little bit too close to this one. But see how it basically removes the stun off of them on application. Okay, so now I want to talk about each spell a little bit more in depth with basically anything that I can think about. So since Q purges, it is commonly used in conjunction with E. So the thing is, a lot of people that I've seen play the hero, they tend to do E and then Q. They do this. Oh wait, they do this. And I personally don't really ever do that outside of farming jungle creeps. And the reason for that is because I feel like fortune's end, I feel like the root is super valuable and I just, want to get as much duration on my root as possible which is why whenever i play um let me give her a heart so she doesn't die so i always channel like this and then i e while the q projectile is in the air so the thing is i get to channel q for as long as i'd like and then while they're still in range i get to nuke them and the projectile, once it lands, will purge it right off. So they'll pretty much get very minimal healing or none. I feel like crowd control is always really strong. So especially when you're against heroes like Storm Spirit, Weaver, Void Spirit, 
who are very, very elusive, getting any type of root on them can be very beneficial. Even heroes like AM who can blink out. Um, that's temporary moment, especially like even Slark, even though Slark has a purge. But it's a moment where they're stationary in place and hopefully you can keep them locked down long enough for you to kill them. So what makes Q really, really incredible is the fact that, like I said, it can be done both offensively and defensively. And one of the best ways for you to use the spell as efficiently as possible is knowing which spells you can remove so since it dispels it is only a basic dispel so stuff like lion's done you won't be able to remove unlike abaddon's shield but as you play the hero and sometimes early on during hero select when the game is loading in i look at the enemy heroes and then in my head i kind of have an idea as to who i will be dispelling in the game or what sort of debuffs that they have available that i can remove so, for example, whenever I play against Dark Willow, I know that she has a root and a stun, both of which you can purge off. So, let me level her up. So, if she stuns me, I can purge this off. I always would rather purge that stun off than root her. And actually, something you can do is, while these roots are out, I can purge both of them at the same time. So if you are kind of like trapped in her maze and she has her stun uh, basically ticking on you, because it doesn't stun you right away, so there's no rush in needing to remove it immediately. But say you're like this. Oh, I'm already rooted. But if I go into another one, dispel it, purge it off. And just saying that like you recognize that there's a delay, so you can always purge multiple things at once if you find yourself able to. Another one that I have thought of recently that is actually pretty great that I haven't used much and uh, didn't really come up with it until now, Bloodray is his W. And basically it places this thing on the ground and then once it pops, you get silenced. So the great thing is that I can sit, sit in this channel myself and the moment it goes off, I get silenced, but I purge it off immediately. I will say though that it's probably, you know, not worth doing unless you're directly in the center. If you're on the edge, just step out of it, right? <laughs> I don't think it's worth wasting this cast just to purge it off. But it was something um, pretty cool that I randomly thought of uh, recently. And also for Void Spirit, his Aether Remnant. So oftentimes Void Spirits buy a, a Yules. And then afterwards they place an Aether Remnant on the ground. So there has been a time where I was able to purge it off. But the thing is, in demo mode, I'm not really able to replicate it reliably. But I have had a moment um, recently in a game where I was able to get it off. So I'm not really sure. Okay. So I think, as you can see, if you're a little bit further away from the remnant, you are able to get it off easier. I don't know if it's always a guarantee though, but I still think it's worth trying, right? So if it's like right here, I don't think there's any way. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but it's definitely something you can do. Also, another thing that would make it easier is say, for example, this guy's right here and say he puts it out while you're still moving. Like say you're slowed by Venomance or, or something. So you're creeping along and then there's no way for you to dodge this as he places it so as you see him throw it out just immediately start channeling on yourself and you'll remove it so i'm not going to go through every single hero and talk about what you can dispel um, a couple things that i do keep in mind as a support you will always be checking people for what items they have so if people have an orchid keep that in mind and um, that's also another thing that I need to get better at myself. If you're in a game against a storm spirit and say he has Orchid and he is showing a pattern of constantly jumping you, because I'll say there are some games where there's a hero that's very good at jumping in the back lines and he doesn't actually go on you. Heroes like Weaver, Ember spirit, storm spirit, um, not every player will play a certain way. So if you are in a game where you feel like they're actually constantly gunning for you, then 
it's not always the easiest to do this, but if you keep watch on your mini map and you also position yourself further away from where you anticipate them engaging you from, if you see Storm zipping across the map and historically he has always gone for you, you could always sit there and channel on yourself just as he's about to zip onto you. And that means that most storms, right after they zip, they orchid you, right? Or more like, I've never really played the hero, but I'm assuming he can orchid while he is zipping. So that would make it so that right after he jumps you, you're going to remove the orchid. That's just something you can try. I haven't successfully done it myself in a game, but I still think it's a good idea. Okay, next up for Fate's Edict. So this spell is often used in conjunction with his E. Because it gives you magic resist, and then that negates the damage done by the E, and then you get heals. So, what makes this spell a little tricky sometimes to use is just making sure that you don't always think of it as, Oh, I'm taking damage, or oh, somebody is nearby trying to kill me, let me heal myself. There are certain heroes that all of their damage done are right clicks so in that case if you're getting dove under the tower you don't want to heal yourself you want to disarm them because then that is their primary source of damage taken away so heroes like bloodseeker if he's standing here right clicking me i would not heal myself i would disarm him and also keep in mind oracle spells are really really short cooldown of course eight second is fairly long but six the good thing about his q that i forgot to mention earlier is that the cooldown starts the moment you cast it. So if you're channeling for 2.5 seconds, by the time it releases, there's only going to be like three to four seconds left on it before you can use it again. So that's one of the tips that I really want um, people to keep in mind for this hero. I just feel like you don't want to leave spells off cooldown for too long just because they really are super short cooldowns. But of course, if there's something specific, that you're anticipating and you want to save it so for example if you've got a monkey king and he is about to get jingu mastery um then you could save it so he's getting stacks i see this and then now he has the buff purge it off so that is like one of the things off the top of my head that I can think about where you can delay casting the spell just a little bit. So for a lot of his spells, specifically his Q and his W, I would say those take practice. You need to play the hero. You need to experience um, scenarios against all different types of heroes. And then over time, you'll start to instinctively cast the spells better and better as you think through like, oh, did I cast this spell wrongly during that team fight? Like, for example, if an Ursa was running at you and you decided to heal yourself instead of disarming him, if you died from that, you can keep that in mind in the future that, oh, hey, next time if I see him somewhere in the team fight, especially around me, and he doesn't have a BKB, let me remember to disarm him. And then other things like Necrophos, actually. I really like playing... Um, Oracle against Necrophos because there is a delay on his ultimate. So his ultimate is also magic damage, which means that if I am able to um, get my Fate's Edict on somebody when his ultimate is still being delayed before the damage is taken, then I negate 100% of his ultimate damage. Okay, so, so see? takes absolutely no damage. I like that a lot. A couple others that really stick out for me are Legion Commander. You can negate duel entirely by disarming the Legion Commander. Of course, that doesn't stop your teammate from getting locked down, but oftentimes when Legion is dueling and she has a lot of dual damage, she can later on start to solo people during duel. So you just disarm her. If you have Aether Lens and there's a Faceless Void on the enemy team and Hopefully he's not on the completely other side of Chrono from you. You could disarm him if he doesn't have BKB. Um, if Winter Wyvern, she ultimates your allies. So she is going to ulti this guy. So I just disarm my ally that's attacking my friend. Effectively saving them both. <laughs> just like his Q, I'm not going to go through every single scenario there is. But I do want to encourage... Uh, anytime you play Oracle, just think through who you're playing against, 
who is on your team and figure out, kind of like plan it ahead of time before team fights happen. Of course, even if you know something, that doesn't mean that you're going to react properly and fast enough whenever a team fight is going on. But of course, stuff like that only gets better with practice. And I will say that having fast reaction times and not needing to think as much when you play the hero just because things start to become second hand. Um, that is definitely when you start to really play this hero to its full potential. So another thing about his W that can be a little bit tricky is there's always certain teammates that don't like to be disarmed, especially during a team fight. So it's tricky because sometimes they're low and you want to heal them, but then it disarms them. And if they're a right clicker, it does negate like all of their damage. They become kind of useless temporarily. If you do want to throw a heal on somebody very briefly, you could always heal them and then purge the debuff off. Oh, yeah. So you would do... Wait. So you would do this and then purge it off if you want to. If somebody is in a team fight and I can tell that they are not exactly going to be in danger or at risk, then I'm just going to let them be. And also, they might have Satanic. So that's something to watch out for. I am not always the best at spotting the Satanic graphic, mainly because I don't play core. So for a while, I wasn't aware what it looked like. But now I do, but it's still not something that I can know easily and right off the bat, especially because... There's so many things going on during team fights, and someone to be glowing a little bit red with Satanic on, you're not always going to notice that. Sometimes they could be standing on top of each other like this. Like, it's just hard to see. Okay, next, for his E. Uh, I will say for a long time while I was playing this hero, I was thinking very one-dimensionally with this whenever it came to the heal, where I wouldn't use it unless I could combo it with Fate's Edict. But I do think that if they are... If you have an ally at say 60 to 80% health, um, and they're in a safe location where they're not at risk of an enemy, then I would rather just nuke and let the healing bring them up. So you can see how it shows that the total heal is more than the damage they take. So they do heal a little bit extra. At, um, at level four, it's like 36 extra, but um, it does still add up. So. Early on, perhaps, if you don't have unlimited mana during laning stage or something and they just need a little bit of help, then just nuke them and don't waste your mana or your cooldown on Fate's Edict. And then, especially when it comes to being offensively with the spell, you need to learn how to gauge how much health they need before you're able to nuke them and secure the kill. But there's also scenarios where you have multiple allies. Uh, nearby so say there's an enemy where it's like guaranteed they're going to die it's like three of your allies on this one person they don't have bkb they can't tp out they're guaranteed going to die in scenarios like that i will always choose to nuke them early knowing that i'm not going to secure the kill but that nuke damage is going to be followed up with all of my allies hitting this person and then it's going to speed up them dying that is the one scenario that i do that Otherwise, honestly, when I play this hero, I don't focus too much on kill stealing. I don't worry about people bitching about stuff like that because there have been times where I hold back and I try to avoid kill and I try to avoid kill stealing and they get away. I personally just don't think that's worth it. This is a team game. I'm not saying that I'm running around constantly like stealing the kills and wanting to take them, but I do feel like especially for a core, an important hero, um, it's just not worth holding back and like letting your core take it, especially if um, they're worth a lot of gold and you don't want to risk them getting away. Oh, and one more thing I do want to mention that I learned recently is that if you nuke an ally that has Blink Dagger and you don't use Fate's Edict, you will be putting Blink Dagger on cooldown. So. Just be careful about that. All right, and lastly, we have his ultimate again, which is an amazing safe spell. And pretty much it's always comboed with healing the person. I will say that sometimes I definitely get agitated when I ult somebody and then they BKB, which means that I can't heal them at all. But 
Of course, since it is a hard to spell, perhaps it was still a save because if they were stunned for a really long duration and you removed it off of them so they could get their BKB off, maybe that's not the worst thing. But I feel like the heal from this is just so strong that it would always be really nice to get at least some of the healing off while they have the buff up because otherwise it just removed the stun. That's it. But... um. One thing that I want you to be careful about is when you use the ultimate, depending on how low their health is too. So say they're at 20% health. Um, if you ult somebody and the duration is like less than half or maybe like one quarter left, I would avoid purifying flames them, especially if they don't have the W up because they're wasn't enough time in the buff left to allow the healing to double and surpass the amount of damage they took, which means that that second E that you use most likely dealt damage and didn't result in any healing done. So I definitely tend to use a spell in two different ways. Um, sometimes you can do... So sometimes I do that. Sometimes I do R-E-W-E. -E. Of course, I think it's probably always better to do this and then heal them both. But sometimes in the moment, I don't know. I do R-E-W-E, -E, but of course, um, R-W-E-E -E is probably just better because the split second of you casting the first Purifying Flames first while taking the damage, I don't think that even if you get that one extra tick with double healing, I don't think it's going to surpass the healing done by R W. Oops, R W E E, because the W negated the full damage of the E. So that sounds a little confusing, maybe, but basically, this, you don't take any damage from your own spells, right? But if you do it the other way, you take damage on the first Purifying Flames. So you can do it however you see fit, but I would definitely say that especially for this spell. I always keep salves in my inventory as long as I have space for it. So since we're supports, I would say it would take maybe like at least 30 minutes before I don't have space in my inventory for salves because we don't get a lot of gold. It takes us a while to complete items. And um, most of our inventory space is taken by like detect or wards or something. So I will always hold these and use them on other people during uh, false promise. Okay, so when it comes to leveling your spells, I personally like to go for 1-4. And that's because with one level of Fate's Edict... Alright, I'm going to reset myself. So this is what it looks like for me at level 4. So at level 1 of Fate's Edict, you will be able to have two cats of Purifying Flames on- Oh, shit. Okay, sorry. Taking that off. Okay. Two casts. But that means that you have to follow up the W with the E immediately. Otherwise, you won't have enough time. If you feel like that's too much of a tight timer for you to get two casts of E off, oh. Then feel free to put a second point in if you see fit. But I like to max Fortune's End so after cool. E. Because, like I said, the 6 second cooldown of the channel is just so short. And I really like being able to just have more options, have lower cooldowns to cast my spells. Because oftentimes during team fights, I will do something like ulti somebody, kill them and then heal them, and then immediately start channeling on somebody else. I, I just really like having this additional shorter cooldown that I'll be able to cast. Um, even if Fate's Edict is maxed, so Octarine is fucking with my cooldowns, 8 and 6 seconds. 8 seconds is pretty long, so if you want to heal somebody and after you're done channeling this on somebody, um, if it's left at 15 seconds, that's a really, really long time. The root can help you with getting somebody off of you that's trying to kill you or it could help your teammate with purges you're just able to react faster 
you don't have to worry about using this cooldown and just feeling like you can't use it for a long as time again. So I just like 414. It encourages my more aggressive playstyle that I like to have with this hero. I don't like to view Oracle as a defensive hero because, yeah, his ultimate can save you. And yes, he has really great heals. But I just think his this combo, I love it. And I think sometimes people often underestimate how much damage you can do with Purifying Flames in lane. There have been many times where I would just harass trade people like this for a while. And then they wouldn't even realize that they're starting to reach a health where I can finish them off with a combo like this. So that's just something you want to keep in mind. Okay, let's move on to talking about items. And I'm going to start off with talking about Agnum Scepter and the Shard really quick. So, I have had a couple of people stop into my stream and tell me that they feel like the Scepter is incredible. And I don't know if I fully agree with that. So, I haven't really done the math as to how much damage and healing that it does. But the main reason that I don't care for it is just that it's so expensive. It's 4,200 gold for a 40 second cooldown. 40 seconds is like an eternity when we've got these short ass cooldowns on our main spells. So also, another thing too, is I don't like the feeling of placing a long ass cooldown worth 4,200 gold in an area that people can move out of. So let me take some experience from other games. When I played World of Warcraft, there was something called the light well. It would be a little thing on the ground that people can right click and receive a heal over time. It's free healing and people would not take the heal. I feel like this is very, very similar where, for example, I would place this on the ground and people would not stand in it. I bet you people would not stand in it and it's like wasting your money. Of course, if you have specific spells that go very well in conjunction with it, like Black Hole, Chronosphere, Mars Arena, then yes, it could be nice to place them together. But I just think that for 4,200 gold, I would much rather prefer having a utility item. I can have two items for the cost of this, for this, <laughs> which I am honestly not really impressed by. So that's just my personal opinion. I like to play Oracle in a way where I stay alive for as long as possible. I delay them killing me for as long as possible. And sometimes when you successfully do that with your items and your spells cast correctly, you will cause a core to be overextended, to be drained of their resources, like their mana. So Ember Spirits or Storm Spirits, like I've had Storm Spirits chase me for so long and I've delayed dying for long enough where I would maybe live, barely get away. Or they would kill me, but by the time they kill me, they have no mana, and then my team is able to clean them up. So I don't like Ag Scepter personally. I would never buy this item unless I'm rich or if I'm given it by Roshan. Okay, so next for the shard, this is something that was baseline on the hero when, it, when he was first released. So I was playing this hero when he first came out. I loved him then because he was... A little bit different, but the good thing is that he's not too different. So one of the differences was his Fate's Edict would still do the same thing. However, it would increase damage taken from physical and pure damage. No longer does that. And another thing, his ultimate was a 20 second cooldown for all levels. And it gave you invisibility. And this was great because as you still see in the year 2022, people do not buy detect. So on a 20 second cooldown... You're purging all of the debuffs on them. You're giving them a hard to spell and you're giving them invisibility, which means that you're keeping your team alive. And 90% of the time when I was playing this hero back then, nobody would have dust or detect for my ultimate, which felt amazing. So with that said, though, I don't really know if I would want to spend 1400 gold for invisibility just because the way that I think about it most of the time, your ultimate will be used on somebody else. And although when I come up with my items for this hero, it sounds like I'm buying them for selfish reasons like trying to stay alive. But the thing is, um, it's still also items that can be used on other people. So 
I usually buy stuff like Force Staff and Glimmer Cape. So those can both be used on yourself and others. I do tend to buy Ghost Scepter sometimes too. If there's a right clicker that is really giving me problems, um, Ghost is really, really great for that. But all of these items prolong my life in a team fight, which benefits my team better because I help to keep them alive. And I'm also able to control enemies with my root as much as I can. Okay, I did go into a little bit on items earlier. And honestly, I don't have too much to say about items because most of the times when you're buying your items, it depends on who you're playing against, right? But for people who watch me stream this hero, they know that my core item is Aether Lens. This is the very first item I ever buy completely. So mm, I guess depending on how the leaning stage is going, I will most likely have a magic wand completed before I get my Aether Lens. So usually, I guess it's pretty much, I start off buying this. So six tangos, mainly because whenever I play Oracle on lane, I tend to send myself consumables constantly because I just don't want to spend the time running back to the fountain and um, losing out on experience. But also, I realize how valuable, in my opinion, I think his spells are super valuable in lane. And I want to make sure that if there's ever an engagement, I'm not starved for mana. So I will send myself clarities. I will always make sure I have mangoes because there's times during an engagement where you don't have enough mana to finish them off with E. And having those mangoes will allow you to do so. Fairy Fire is also an item I've started to buy on almost every support hero that I've been playing just because whenever you're engaging with somebody, sometimes you guys tunnel so much that you don't think about what they have in their inventory. And oftentimes people don't really check, right? So I'm just trading with somebody and we're both being stubborn and not backing down. And then I bait him because I'm not certain if he knows I have a fairy fire, but I'm banking on the fact that that's an element of surprise. So there have been times too where I kind of trade with somebody and I allow myself to get really low and then I back down towards tower and then they dive me under tower and then they die because they don't know that I have a fairy fire. And of course that healing salve just really helps to keep you sustained. Um, I don't really buy this too much extra during laning stages. I know I said that I keep it around anytime I have false promise, but most of laning stage, mm, you're not gonna be six just yet. So I tend to buy it once at the very beginning. Uh, in between, I, I don't know. I tend to stick to tangos unless I'm sitting at like, you know, 10% health. Like if I have 10% health and I have a fair amount of mana, I don't wanna run back to base. I'm gonna set myself a salve. And then of course sentries, are for the war where you're trying to block camps, deward your own, uh, work on lane equilibrium and all of that. Okay, so aside from starting build, I mentioned that Aether Lens is a core item for me. And that's just because of my play style. The main reason that I enjoy having this item is because it allows me to still have them be in range for purifying flames while I'm channeling. So for example, if I'm channeling on somebody, I can still manage to get my E off while they're running away. There's plenty of times where you're channeling it on somebody and they're trying to run away. And so while you're channeling it on them and they're running away, um, I can have further range on my E, which allows me to channel for longer and have a longer route on them. I really enjoy having that benefit. And of course, I just really like cast range. It allows you to stay in a safer position, um, especially for a hero where people are always, generally they should be trying to kill you. If you're able to stay in a safer place, you have good positioning, it makes their job even harder. And it also allows you to save your teammates from a safer distance. You can cast your ultimate sooner and save them um whereas like if i didn't have aether i would probably need to be closer like over here and then maybe by then it would be too late so i just really like this i don't feel like i fully enjoy playing oracle until i buy this so that's just my uh 
personal opinion. I do know that urn slash spirit vessel is an item that goes very, very well in conjunction with false promise. But I never buy it on this hero. Um, like I said earlier, I like my utility items a lot. Yeah, so if I have somebody on me, yes, Spirit Vessel does provide me stats, but I don't feel like it provides the same benefits of survival as, like I said, Ghost Scepter, Glimmer, Four Staff. Those are all things that can really, really make their job that much harder in trying to kill you, whereas this doesn't. So I don't think it's a bad purchase whatsoever because it does go in conjunction with your ultimate. But if you think about it, that is kind of spending how much a spirit vessel is pretty expensive 2980 for a eventually one minute cooldown and i just don't that's not my play style but um feel free to buy it if you like it and you if you really want it to boost your ultimate there's nothing wrong with that this is a great item by itself right if you want to use it offensively on people too um it's actually an item that should probably be purchased more often whether it's the offlaner or the four, but um, I'm just saying that I never buy this item. <laughs> and then, of course, I guess Magic Wand still counts as a fully completed item, but I always buy this on any support hero that I play. And also, Magic Wand does go well with your ultimate, too. So if people are going on you, just try to remember not to use wand, especially if you're anticipating, if you're like getting jumped on and you know that when you're getting out of the stun, you're going to ult yourself, just make sure you use wand only after you ult yourself. Oh yeah, and something I forgot to mention earlier is just that there's this orb up here, you see? Um, that shows whether you will be gaining heals after this debuff, after this buff expires or whether you'll be taking damage. So if you're going to be healing, it will glow green. But if you're going to take damage, it will glow red. Um, I don't trust it personally because there have been times where it's glowing red, but I see somebody's health kind of remain around the same or be slightly higher. Like they don't actually take a chunk of damage afterwards. So I don't trust this. I don't even bother like letting the color of this affect what I'm anticipating. It's always a surprise for me. But yes, for remaining items, those are always dependent on how the game is going. If you are dying a lot, if you have enemy heroes that are constantly going for you and killing you, and you already have, you know, Glimmer, Four Staff, Ghost, whatever, and you still feel like you're having a hard time, then feel free to buy items like Aeon Disc. But if they have a lot of debuffs, if they have a lot of single target spells, Lotus is great. So that's why I don't want to go too into detail on what further items to get other than the main core ones that I tend to get because it's always situational. Oh, and actually something that I didn't do much before, but I do recommend now and something I want to try a bit more is once you... So what I end up doing is I always buy boots. I go into arcane boots and then I disassemble it and then I purchase aether with the remaining components. So that leaves you with brown boots. Um, I do recommend spending the money finishing it into Tranquil, just because recently I was looking at one of my clips of this hero from a couple years ago. And what I noticed, and it's just, it's nice to see and it's super helpful, but there's times in a team fight where I'm not right clicking anything. And I'm also in a safe place where nobody is hitting me which means that Tranquil Boots is active and I am passively healing a decent amount. Um, if you're in a situation like that and say you're at like 30% health and you're just standing on the side, casting on people and whatever, then um, that means that you're getting a good amount of healing. And also if enough time passes, you could heal to a good chunk of health, like 60 to 70% from doing nothing and just from a nice fairly inexpensive item. So that's why I would say that um, this might be worth getting. And also it does give you extra health regeneration, which could be a tiny minuscule amount that you benefit off of in False Promise. But um, yeah, the movement speed is nice. It's not too expensive. So this is something I would definitely recommend.
All right, so here is a clip I pulled off of my stream recently for a little bit of the leaning stage. And honestly, I don't really have too much to say about it because creep equilibrium is something that you manage on whichever hero you play, right? And um, something that I will say, though, is that I don't do a good job at securing the range creep with my spells. I always forget to do that. So once you have higher levels of E, definitely try to secure with that spell. It's perfect for it. But also... I would say avoid casting or being offensive with Q and E until you're level three, just because level one of E is so small, the damage. And since mana is super valuable, especially on a hero like Oracle, when I love to cast spells, I don't want to waste a cast on a level one E. So you see here that we're trading a lot. I really like Oracle's auto attack. I feel like it comes out really fast. I think the range is pretty decent. So times like this, um, I will also say that since I play Oracle fairly aggressive, I like it best when I have a core that will choose to be aggressive with me. But you see here, I'm able to secure two kills. Okay, so this is another clip from, I think this was yesterday, actually. And there's just certain players, whenever I'm leaning with them, I don't necessarily feel in sync with them. And that just always really sucks. I feel like whenever that happens, I you kind of just need to do your best with pulling. Honestly, whenever I play five, I don't care if I get under leveled and my core gets all the leveling, especially when I don't feel like I'm in sync with them. Because if we're not, and my only job is to pull and focus on the lane, I would rather just like not even be in the lane and I'll just sit and wait on the side to stack camps in the jungle or I'll pull the lane because I feel like my presence in the lane is worthless anyways because if I'm just sitting there as presence to make sure that my core feels safe, but if we ever cast spells, they just feel like they go to waste. I don't know if people fully understand what I mean, but... um. When I play Oracle, I feel like kill potential in a lane is pretty strong. I think the QE combo is a lot of damage. It's crowd control with the root. And if my core just wants to stare at creeps and hit them, then I'd rather not even be around. <laughs> so that's honestly just how I view laning. Um, I just feel like, especially since our job is um, blocking the camps and also dewarding them, there have been very, very few cores that I play with who actually assist you with that. And I will say that it makes a huge difference when they do. Anytime I'm playing against a lane where the core actually comes over to try to intercept me, then it makes my job that much harder. And it also makes their lane e easier to manage, right? Because I'm not able to interfere as much. But if you have a core that never leaves the lane, they don't ever go off to the side. I had somebody... So you see where my hero is right now, where that sentry is? You see how close the Shadow Fiend is? I had a core once. There was an OBS on the enemy team. There was an OBS by the enemy team there, and I was trying to deward it with a sentry, and the enemy heroes killed my sentry before I was able to kill their sentry. And not having a core walk over... I don't know, two feet just to help you out. That's really infuriating, especially when a lot of people, when they play core, they have a mentality where you, you're you you're supposed to do everything for them. You're supposed to give them all of your regen. You're supposed to give them all of your salves. And um, this was a four-person dive on bot. So unfortunately, even if I cast my spells as well as I could have, there's no surviving this. But um yeah, I I would just say those are kind of just my thoughts when it comes to laning. And um, it really does rely a lot on synergy with your core, believe it or not. Okay, so now I want to go through a few clips. And unfortunately, some of them will be muted just because I have music playing and I don't want to get copyright striked. But um, for this... So here, you see me do the combo on Void Spirit. So here, I was definitely hesitant to force Staff over and finish him off with E. Um, I could have done it much sooner, but I just personally don't like to use force Staff offensively because 
uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I want to stay alive. And if I put myself in a bad position, which I did, I put myself in a very offensive position there. But the Ghost Scepter allowed me to negate all of TB's damage. And um, after that, we were just able to clean everything up very smoothly. So this is early on during laning stage. And I totally fucked up my E. I casted it on the creep, as you can see. I'm amazed that I still had mana to cast for the rest of this engagement. But I do still have two mangoes. And my thought process during that, the reason that I was just tanking his hits is because I definitely felt a little cocky. I was like, oh, I have six stick charges. This isn't going to matter so much to me. But um, I was really surprised that I was able to juke him through the trees. And I don't know if you noticed either. I used my salve. So right here, I used it and I got like one tick off of it. And I do think that mattered. So as you can see, I lived with 50 health. Maybe I would still have lived with like 10 health, but... I'm sure that salve um, made a pretty big difference. Okay, so here I had no idea that Slaughter was coming by. I got really, really fortunate that there was that tiny second, tiny split second where I was able to get my ultimate off. And because of that, I lived. During that, I had two casts of my Purifying Flames up and I also had a salve as well. But um, that is also why I say um, having really quick fingers on this hero is extremely important. There have been so many times where I am surprised by something and really close to dying, but I managed to get my ultimate off. So you just need to be very, very fast and reactionary. My died for nothing. Holy oh. fuck! No. Uh oh. Keep chasing me, guy. Okay, so there's definitely going to be a couple clips that I want to show first without my comments, and then I will comment over it. So after seeing that clip, I want to watch it over and comment on it, but I'm going to mute it just because in case I don't want my talking in the clip to overlap with what I'm saying here, or just I don't want there to be any um, noise that is challenging each other. So let's go back to the start. Okay, so let's go back to the start. So let me give a quick rundown from what I remember of this clip. PA is obviously very low here, right? I actually thought that she was going to die so much sooner since he was chasing her. So I was thinking um, my Q is coming off cooldown soon. Let me just kill this Grimstroke really quick because I know that I can. And then we'll keep going. So here, finish him off. So I went, went to watch PA. I was amazed that she was still alive. I had no idea that creep was blocking me in the trees. So he body blocked me a little bit here. I disarmed him. And here I turned and I rooted him. I actually think that it would have been better to root myself. That's actually something that I didn't think about when I watched this over um, a while ago. But I had his slow on me. If I rooted myself so look here he cast the spell on me i turn around and i root him while i'm walking away the debuff is still on me if i rooted myself he would get the same duration on the root whereas i would have free movement speed i would be able to get further distance away from the night stalker which would buy me more time and then the other reason why I decided to loop around the tower like this is because I wanted to make sure he was constantly in tower range and taking that damage. I also decided that I wanted to fairy fire early there because I had the idea in my head that his cast was probably up soon, which means that I would be getting chunked for a lot of health. And actually, when it comes to fairy fire, 
for a while, I would bait people by letting my health get super low. And then I would try to wait until the very last second to use it to surprise them. But in a situation like this, my intuition was correct because shortly after I used fairy fire, he used his cast. If I didn't fairy fire, I would have died. So I definitely did the right thing. Let's go back and show it again. Right here, I used fairy fire. Or after I go around the circle once. <laughs> okay, here. Okay, so I disarmed him. And then right here, it is extremely important for me to wait until disarm falls off before I nuke him. If I mistimed that, I would be healing him and he would have killed me. So I timed it perfectly. I was actually worried that when I turned around the turn time, I was worried that would delay me long enough for him to hit me. I'm pretty sure if he just auto attacked me one more time, I would have died there. So I felt pretty good about that play. Okay, so before I start this clip, I want to give a quick background. So this is a 6.5k average game that I played around three years ago. So three years ago, I was streaming a lot of Dota. It was also when I had the highest MMR that I had, which was hovering around like 5.2k to 5.6. And um, I was in a party in this game. I was partied up with Gyrocopter and Invoker. And it was also a somewhat imbalanced MMR game because yellow and orange were partied together and their MMR was significantly higher. But anyways, in this game, we were having a really rough early game. Um, yellow and orange were being pretty toxic. This was actually a really unenjoyable game at the time. But if anyone ever wants to watch through this game in its entirety, I do have it highlighted on Twitch. And I do actually think it's a great match to watch if you want to learn Oracle, just because um, there's a lot going on. It's a high MMR game, and it's also a comeback, which I think the last 30 minutes of this match is just a lot of fighting. It's very stressful for me, but um, definitely worth watching. So anyways, let's get into this first clip. I know I was silenced the whole time. I was pressing it as fast as I could. Okay, so we're back at the start, and the fight is about to begin. So here, Invoker gets silenced. I was definitely a bit slow to purge it off because it had already been half duration by the time. I see Monkey on the tree, and I decide to dis disarm him because all of his damage is physical. And it's good that Invoker didn't cast any spells on Monkey because he wouldn't have taken any damage. So here, when I watch it over, I did not need to ulti. Invoker. He was definitely taking damage from Brew, but once he went into Ghost Walk, you see that they don't have the tech, so he was safe. And I wasted my ultimate on him. If I saved the cooldown from and not used it on Invoker, I could have saved Axe right here because here you see at the top of my screen, he's dying. And I'm not certain actually if I would have been able to out heal him through Storm's damage because you see here, say False Promise is up. I don't have Fate's Edict up because it's only level one. So I would have only been able to nuke him probably once with Purifying Flames only. If I used a second nuke on him, I don't think it would have out healed the damage taken. So um, I still think that's still better than what I did because you're delaying his death. You're buying time for him to do more stuff. He also could blink out because since a uh, False Promise delays damage, his blink cooldown doesn't get procced from enemy damage. Here, I purge off, and like I said earlier, I demonstrated. Dark Willow, I got rooted and stunned debuff at the same time. I purged them both off with one cast. 
And then here, I needed to spend time healing um, Invoker. I definitely think if I casted in faster succession, I could have gotten a second Purifying Flames off on him. But the good thing is he still lived. I do the QE combo on Willow. Finished that uh, pesky branch woman off. And then here. So another thing to keep in mind is whenever a hero is at the top of a tornado or a Yule Scepter, you can still target them and start channeling, which is fantastic because they're invulnerable anyways, which means that you're channeling for as long as you can. And then by the time they land, you get a longer channel off. Aside from purging Monkey, I need to purge my teammates way more. Connect on that. Man, I can't help you. It's alright. Alrighty, so let's talk about it. So here I had to ulti Invoker to save him. And then you see that after my second E cast, I immediately start channeling on Storm. And you see that I use Purifying Flames on him. And he wasn't taking enough damage to die from my nuke. But I did that because Storm is their main hero outside of Brew in their matchup that's really evasive, elusive. That's really easy to get away. We need to get him locked down really hard. So we have Axe Call. We've got Earthshaker spells. We've got Invoker, Cold Snap, um, and also my Root. So after I finished casting on Invoker, I wanted to make sure I started to channel on Storm because I saw that we had him locked down and I wanted to make sure that while he was, that we would be chaining them where we could hopefully be able to kill him. And I decided to nuke him also, hoping that whoever else is up there would be able to finish him off. And we did, which is really important. So even though after he died, um, we weren't able to win the fight because you see here that um, I got controlled for too long by Brew, which meant that I couldn't help out um, our gyrocopter. And at this point, we're kind of just trying to clean up the mess. And I'm trying to keep Invoker alive, but... I'm getting gone on by all the heroes, so I definitely can't live. I can't go first. Holy shit, he has a BKB. God damn it. Watch over time. Definitely got really lucky there where he was able to get the call off before he was able to jump away. So this was a really good coddle ulti because it got four of us in there outside of Jaro with his BKB. But I needed to ulti Axe there. And I definitely had the ability to use um, my W, my Fate's Edict on him. I didn't decide to. But as you can see, he's able to TP out and he is able to live, which is always really, really great. So here I was very slow. Well, I would say I was slow to dispel Dark Willow stun off of him. But if you see, by the time my dispel comes off cooldown, look, it's already about to proc. So I wouldn't have been able to purge it off, especially with travel time. 
So I kind of wasted my Q cooldown here. Earthshaker's low, I go over to heal him. And then immediately after, I start channeling on the Dark Willow. Like I said, I always do that a lot. I do a defensive cast and then I immediately turn and do my QE combo on somebody else. Axe comes back here, which is great because I saved him earlier. He went to Fountain to heal up and now he is re-engaging back onto the fight. And then this next moment I'm very sad about because I did not realize, oops, oh, it's not playing. Okay, sorry, I had to go back a little bit. Um, this next part I'm really sad about because I don't know why I didn't realize my Glimmer was off cooldown. I didn't use it on Gyrocopter and I could have easily saved him there. So that was definitely one of those moments where I just missed it somehow. There's, there's just a lot of stuff going on. When you play Oracle, the thing is when you have shorter cooldowns, it means that your brain is active way more because you have to analyze everything. You need to figure out how you want to cast your spells as effectively as possible. There can be different scenarios where you have different targets that you can cast on, right? But you want to pick the best, in your opinion, the best option. So I think that was just one of those moments where I just tunnel visioned a little hard. And whenever I watch this clip over, I'm a little sad about it. But, you know, it was still a pretty good fight considering we had a very weak early game. Rue has no BKB nold, just wait it out. We have time. Monkey's in the trees right here. Monkey's right here. Turn, he has no he has no BKB. Okay, so one thing definitely you want to keep in mind, look at my positioning. I am playing really safe. Even though Storm is dead, I just don't want to be out there in the open. I want to be playing at a safe distance. So Brew has BKB up. He just used his ultimate. And even though I don't have sound, um, I do believe Gyro called out to just delay. Um, one thing I do want to point out here, though, and I do think it's very important, is that you see how I only used four staff on the Earthshaker. So sometimes I think in the heat of the moment, um, people tend to use everything at once, right? So sometimes, you know, for example, if I suddenly get jumped and I'm panicking, I might use, you know, Ghost Scepter, Glimmer Cape, and four staff, like all in a quick succession, just because I'm like, oh God, I gotta live. I'm panicking. But um, here I wanted to point out that I use one item as I saw fit because if you stagger them, um, you're not overlapping things and then some might go to waste. So for example, after I forced staffed Earthshaker, he also had his Ag, so he was able to jump away. If I used Glimmer, I wouldn't have had it right here when I was getting some pressure. Um, Brew is here and so is Monkey King. And I think I definitely... Um, spent a little bit longer than I should have channeling there, but I think it turned out all right. And then here I need a glimmer again on the earth shaker. I got rooted, I forced stuffed forward, which kind of didn't really need to do. And then I spent some time here healing the earth shaker. And then here at this point, we're kind of just cleaning up. Um, I definitely released my cue a little early there, but, um, Overall, it turned out to be a pretty good fight. Brutal, dude. Fuck. In the air. Wait. 
Wait, what the fuck is happening? They're just not dying. Fuck, I'm out of mana. Monkey has old. Five ages. Oh shit. Shit. I probably killed the Earthshaker by accident. Oh, I have old here. Stay with me. <gasps> oh my god, I wasn't paying attention to my own health! That was so bad. That was so bad. Oh my god, we fucked that up so hard. Fuck. Alright. Oh my god. Thank you for the subs, you crazy person. Alright, let's talk about this fight. It's a very, very long one, so I'll try to be as precise as possible. So the positioning of this fight, first off, I'm not a big fan of because as a support, squishy support, I don't really like to be... Um, the tier 2 tower is still up, right? So I don't want to be moving too close to it where I'm taking hits from it. So for the most part, I'm trying to stay over here and not overextend. And I'm trying to do as much as I can. But it's difficult. Especially because they keep moving further and further closer to their base. So I stay here as much as I could. I... Purge off the fear on X, heal him up, and he goes back in. So there, I do think I incorrectly purged Gyro because Invoker has the debuff, but I think in the heat of the moment, I may have misread who had the debuff, so... Yeah. I did get the heal off him, but um, here it's still pretty hectic. And then this is actually the clip that I wanted to mention that I paid attention to me having Tranquil Boots. Because you see here, I'm gradually losing health, but I am so focused on my teammates that I'm not spending any globals casting on myself. So you see, while this entire time, I'm slowly, slowly getting some health. And it actually makes a big difference in my opinion so also in this clip um gyrocopter has aegis which is why you see me not using my ultimate on him here i did kind of fuck up because i i used purifying flames on es and you see how low he is here this was definitely a moment that i went back to check though because even if I didn't nuke him, he was 100% dead anyways. Because you see here, right after Monkey ults, he also casts his stun. That's massive damage on the ES. And he stunned in Monkey King ult. He's 1,000% dead. And then here, he's about to die. Aegis procs. And then as you still can see, I'm not paying attention to my own health. And then I'm very, very sad that I was tunnel visioning like that. I mean, you know, as an oracle keeping people alive, it's not, I mean, <laughs> it does suck to not keep yourself alive. But here, he actually did a really good play. So he has, is it, at the time, I think his acceptor, I don't know if it's still the same, but it's the side gunner, where it's kind of like, what, automatically attacking at, at different intervals. So I believe he popped Satanic and BKB while he's teleporting. So he's still attacking, as you can see, and getting a little bit of heals there. And then he was able to live uh, through the teleport. He, 
bonito. Oh my god. Wait, why were we there? You were first on me. Turn on this guy soon. This is so long. Fuck. Oh my god, fuck. Oh my god, my heart rate is beating so high. I'm so. Like, this is so stressful. I am so stressed out right now. I am so stressed out right now. My fucking heart. Rate is jacked up so high. Okay, so here, Monkey King is already dead, which is definitely an advantage to us. Um, that definitely sucked because I believe Earthshaker did not. Yeah, or maybe he did. I, I think he did miss the ultimate though because of the knockback. It was just bad timing. I needed to ulti axe, but like I mentioned before, it sucks when they BKB after you ulti because now I can't heal him at all and by the time I can heal him he's only getting a very very tiny benefit outside of the the double healing the stun removal here I definitely was casting it immediately once I got into range but unfortunately it was just not soon enough I could have four staffed there to save him but as you can see here if I used that four staff there I would not have lived here this was a lot of shit going on so first off you see that they earned me and then i use face edict so the dark willow here made a mistake if you watch him he doesn't auto attack me if he auto attacked me i would have been dead way sooner but he chose to ignore me and focus on other people most likely because he thought it was a guarantee that i was dead so watch he casts, he walks past me, and he just ignores me. I used Ghost, I four-staffed up the hill, and Storm had a projectile of an attack going on me. So even if I didn't have Ghost Scepter, there was also a chance that he could have had the uphill miss, but I barely survived. Let's see how low I get down to. 47 health. One last auto attack, uphill. I was Ghost Scepter, so it doesn't matter. I purged off um, the debuffs I had on me, and this was actually a pretty long fight. I did hold my Fates Edict way too long. So it's up for so long. I could have healed myself right now during this time. I uh, could have casted it on Gyro much sooner and healed him, but I don't know why. I just held it. So here Axe comes to help, and then I use it on myself to try to stay alive from S Storm because I'm stressed out <laughs> playing this hero in a team fight like this. And that moment, I was extremely upset because if I four staffed and then I rooted him, I would have stopped that TP. But he got away. Very unfortunate. Man, he went in too deep. I had a feeling. Give that to Invoker. Invoker, take that. I don't want to fight this soul. Get back. Oh my god! Oh my god, my oh, fucking windows! Me. Sorry for screaming, but like, I literally hit my fucking windows key while he was trying to kill me. I don't have much mana, okay. <laughs> if I died- wait, regen. 
Can I? I'm grabbing this. I'm coming. I got him. So I should just. Oh my god, this game is ridiculous! Holy shit! Base is gonna die. Alright. Alright, finally we are nearing the end of the game. So, Storm had to buy back. And I was watching Earthshaker because I wanted to see if I could help him, but he is too far in to see my positioning. <laughs> I wanted to try to get some casts on him, but I decided he's just a lost cause at this point. So I will have to back up and we will try to re-engage. Here I used the four staff just because I don't think I was paying too much attention to my minimap. But I was also concerned that if I got stunned on the high ground that maybe their team was following up and it would have put me in a very dangerous position. So I four staffed myself down and then Storm here is trying to go on me. I used both Glimmer and Ghost at the same time. That, like I said earlier with the overlapping, if Storm wasn't hexed, that would have been okay because that would have negated 100% of Storm's damage, right? He can't attack me and no magic damage. So here I spend time healing myself. He BKBs. Or, wait, did he BKB? Oh no, he was taunted. Or, he had BKB for a short duration, I guess, there. And then it faded by the time it went on me here. Here, I panicked because I accidentally pressed my Windows key like I was freaking out about and uh, barely survived after that mess up. So this, like I said earlier, was a game I was very stressed out over, partially because teammates were um, being very negative and just didn't enjoy playing with them. So here... Um, I'll say that for Monkey King, I'm not used to purging off his buff. So that's not something that I looked for easily in this game. So you see here, he's got Jingu Mastery and he's about to get a stack. I just casted my root, so I don't get to dispel his lifesteal here. By the time I do have it up, though, I do cast, but he already got his full heal off of the stun, which is unfortunate. And then by now, while I'm trying to pursue him, still getting controlled like crazy and it's just relief <laughs> to have uh that team fight and and yeah pretty much that is the gist of those clips and yeah that's pretty much the gist of that game um like i said earlier this is definitely a good game to watch over if you just want to see um it was very exciting i think as a viewer the last 30 minutes there's a lot going on and it's a high skill game but um these are the types of games for Oracle that I wished I was able to play more of in the present day. I think high skill games on a, hero, on a hero like Oracle is a lot of fun because it's very challenging and it um, really forces you to have better awareness. Awareness is extremely important on a hero like Oracle. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed those clips. Okay, quick overview on this next game um i was queued up with slardar and somehow i think this was during a time when matchmaking was a little bit funky but we got queued up into sumail and kitrak they are both on our team um sumail is playing slark and kitrak is playing gyrocop gyrocopter and um zeus is also partied up with us and he decided to go uh, as four, even though he queued as mid, just because Kit Rack wanted to play some mid. Okay, so here I just want to mention my positioning. 
on the mini map, you see that Marana is on bottom left, and then the rest of the enemy team is in the bottom right area. Um, even though I know that most of my teammates have gone uphill or are about to, I don't follow them up willingly because um, I just want to make sure that I stay on the outskirts. And they also have heroes like Bristle, Drow can definitely kill me very quickly. And I want to make sure that I keep myself in a safe position. So now I come up around. And then here I get um, zoned out by Keeper's Willow Wisp. And me and Zeus would take, you know, 20 million years to kill it. But I guess it faded there. I guess it was only three pulses there. So since he's teleporting out, I make sure I release my root immediately to stop it. And then just nuke him to finish it off. Okay, so they are pushing into our tier one. And, um... Yeah, our gyro was already dead, but here, you see, make sure to call out the dodge, the arrow. And there, I definitely nuked Bristle too early. For a hero like him that's very tanky, I definitely don't recommend you do <laughs> something like that. He doesn't live very long before we're able to finish him off, but um, he's just very, very tanky. So the nice thing that I actually want to point out about this Lardar is that even though he's very low health and I did toss a heal on him, I do really like it when offlaners still help with initiating like this, even though they're low and they're about to die. I think that shows like a really good understanding of um, but just like fight awareness. You see that Drow and Marana are still alive, but... Marana is right. She's the four in this game and we're catching the drow out and we've got all five alive. So it's really good that he continued to pursue. So that was a moment where I did my nuke early and then the Slark was able to finish her off. Okay, so this is just a random clip of basically starting to reach mid game. So once Ursa used his ultimate there, I just decided to disarm him. And I was about to ulti him, but he used his uh, rage. So he, he came over, went inside, and now we're getting pursued. I'm a, I'm a freaking pig right now. And you see that I get stunned. I remove the stun. And that's just kind of what I really love about Oracle. I just feel sometimes when I play this hero and I have all my spells available, I feel pretty safe. Um, when I get dove, if I know that I'm using my spells correctly. So them being overly aggressive there really cost them big. Cost them four heroes, actually. Hopefully what I mentioned and what I showed today were as detailed as they can be. Um, forgive me if I left anything out that you think could be additionally helpful. But... Uh, I love this hero. I am happy to talk about and show um, what this hero can do. And I hope this guide has helped you at least in some way. Thank you for watching.